My name is Cynthia Vitters, and I lead the enterprise risk management practice at Deloitte for GPS, which is the government public services sector, which includes the federal government, state, local government, and higher ed. So, you know, before we get started and I kick things over to start the webinar, I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk to everyone about the Marilyn Smith Risk Academy. Um, and this series of webinars has sort of been a sneak peek um, preview to what is to come with the Risk Academy, which we're about to kick off. Um, and, you know, just a little bit about what it, what it is. It's a collaboration between the Maryland Smith School and Deloitte to strengthen and sharpen mid-career professional skills and applied risk management topics. Um, when we kick this off, we will have a total of seven two-hour modules that will be presented via Zoom. And you know, just to give you a preview of what those topics will include, um, the modules will include building a sustainable risk management program, ERM and credit risk, cyber risk and mitigation for regulators, risk modeling and governance, liquidity and capital risk, operational and regulatory risk management, and finally climate change and financial management risk. So each module will be led by Professor Cliff Rossi, who's also here with us today, um, a Deloitte professional, as well as a relevant module luminary who will provide practical real world examples in the space of the module that we're conducting. So the program is set to launch on January 11th of 2022, so right around the corner, and it will conclude February 1st of 2022. The Smith School is hosting informational sessions to provide greater context on the program, which are free and available to the public for sign up via their website. So again, this is a great opportunity um, for each of us to learn and grow with like-minded individuals and in the broader financial services and government risk management space. Um, so again, today's webinar is just a sneak preview of what's to come early next year with the Maryland Smith School Federal Risk Academy. So again, thank you all for joining, and I'm going to hand it over to Cliff Rossi, who will introduce our topic and our guest um, for today's session on a science's take on climate modules and risk management applications. Over to you, Cliff. All right. Well, thank you, Cynthia, for your support for our Risk Academy and this webinar series. So today, we are actually deviating a little bit from our typical guest that's usually either a senior risk leader in government or industry, and we're going to feature... Uh, Tim, Professor Tim Canty, uh, a real climate scientist, to help us better understand what's behind the climate models underlying much of the climate risk scenario analysis that uh, folks in the financial services industry and their regulators uh, are dealing with these days, such as those that are produced uh, by such organizations as the Network of Central Banks and Supervisors for Greening the Financial System, or NGFS, you may have heard. So, so Tim is a faculty colleague of mine at the University of Maryland, and he's working with a number of us from across the campus on an interdisciplinary climate finance and risk program. Tim is also an associate professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, where he serves as the co-director of their undergraduate and professional master's programs, which he helped design. He's also the director of the Marine Estuarine and Environmental Sciences Program, which is a statewide graduate program across four universities and the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Uh, before coming to Maryland in 2007, he was a Caltech postdoctoral scholar at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab and a lecturer in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at UCLA. He studies stratospheric ozone loss, air quality policy, and climate change. So, so welcome, Tim, and uh, thank you for joining us for this, uh, for this webinar series. Uh, before we jump into the discussion for everybody out there in the audience, I'd like to set the stage just a little bit. The focus on climate change has accelerated, as you well know, it seems, within the last year with several notable highlights. The UN's Climate Change Conference, COP26, just concluded last week. Uh, the IPCC released its much-anticipated AR6 climate report. And various financial regulatory and oversight authorities in the U.S. are ramping up their activities around climate change, including the Federal Reserve, the OCC, the SEC, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, New York State Department of Financial Services, among others. And central to those efforts are climate models used to form the basis of scenario and stress testing and risk assessments for things like climate disclosures for the, T the TCFD, Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, for example. 
And the complexity of these models tends to relegate a deep understanding of them to the scientific community. And yet the companies that we're talking about here and their regulators are going to need to figure out new ways to adapt their output to conducting these financial risk assessments. So Tim, with that as a backdrop, would you, would you just mind maybe kicking us off today by giving us a, a brief overview of exactly what we're talking about with regard to climate models that we read about in the popular press and what are the, some of the key inputs and outputs? Sure. Um, thanks, Cliff, and thanks for having me this morning. Um, first off, I want to assure everyone there won't be a quiz at the end of this hour. Um, and also, I'm going to apologize in advance. I think we can all agree that within our communities, we are very comfortable with our own acronyms and definitions. And I try very hard not to get into that jargon. But if there's something I say that doesn't make sense, please stop or put something in chat, and, uh, and I'll be sure to... Uh, try to clarify that. And just a case in point, I was doing outreach a while back talking about satellite instruments, and this was to a group of middle schoolers, and the one student was wondering why there's trombones on the space station. Like, oh, yeah, we use the word instruments very differently. So um, <laughs> with, with that in mind, so, you know, what goes into climate models? What doesn't go into climate models and how they've developed over the years? Fundamentally, climate models are basically a mathematical representation of what I'm going to call the Earth system. The atmosphere, the ocean, the land, the biosphere, uh, the cryosphere, ice, and how all of these things interact. And that's... <laughs> it's a tall order to try to represent all of these systems in basically lines of computer code. And back in the 60s and 70s, the computer models were very simplistic compared to today's standards. Basically, you had a, a surface and you had an atmosphere and maybe you tried to get precipitation correct and temperature, but as computers have gotten more powerful, it's allowed the scientific community to increase the complexity of the computer models to represent um, interactions on finer scales. And fundamentally, it's basically just applying a whole bunch of equations to understand the energy balance within the Earth system and how that impacts things like uh, drought and rain and where clouds are forming and what temperatures are. And the models are Basically, they, they're designed to break up the entire planet into a series of grid boxes as a function of latitude, longitude, and altitude. So you take the atmosphere, the land, the ocean, and just divide everything up into boxes. And the initial models were two boxes. You had land and you had atmosphere. And over time, we've gotten more and more boxes. At, they're much smaller, I'm going to say finer resolution. But these come at a computational cost. Uh, which requires more computer code. And I think the modern models now, if you actually printed out the computer code, some estimates I've read, up to about 20,000 pages of, of printed computer code uh, that go into these models uh, to represent what's happened in the past and also used to make predictions of what happens in the future. Um, and it's not just representing the planet on smaller spatial scales, but also time or temporal scales. You know, maybe in the past you could run a computer model for a given year and you just do year by year by year, but then it's down to months and then days and then hours and then minutes. And so you're trying to represent all these very complicated processes on finer and finer temporal time and spatial resolution to try to develop the best representation of our understanding of this Earth system. It requires a lot of time, hundreds of scientists and engineers just to develop the inputs and the basic code and then testing. These things are battleships or aircraft carriers. You can't just hit the download wizard on Windows and put it on your laptop. They require massive technological investment, uh, investments and advancements in uh, computer technology, uh, which makes it difficult to develop, uh, to maintain, and, and only some company, uh, countries and now some companies uh, and universities are able to develop and maintain these, these models. Fundamentally, I'm a modeler, uh, and the old adage is all, all models are bad, some are useful. And as a modeler, though, I'm not beholden to the models. They're part of a toolkit. 
to understand and probe our understanding of what's going on outside. And if the model doesn't agree with the atmosphere or the ocean, I'm not going to say that Mother Nature is wrong. Uh, obviously, the model is always right because I'm a modeler. No, it forces us as a scientific community to go back and say, okay, um, what's going on? What have we missed? And, you know, so there's a lot of demands on the climate models to tell us exactly what's going to happen in the next 10, 20, 100 years, and also what's where exactly these things are going to happen. And in terms of, you know, inputs and outputs, some of the inputs are, you makes sense greenhouse gases um if if we you know agree on the science here that greenhouse gases lead to a kind of an increase of warming of the lower atmosphere so how do greenhouse gas concentrations change and cliff and i were joking earlier i've got my own co2 monitor in my office you know globally we're at about i think 420 parts uh uh, PPM parts per million, my office at 616, yet I'm not living in a tropical paradise in my office. So, you know, how do you represent these uh, small scale features and large scale features? So greenhouse gases are inputs, things people may not consider though as important, population. You know, if there aren't any people, we don't care about climate because we're not here. But fundamentally, it comes down to uh, energy use whether it's for growing food or to keep the lights on and keep the heat on and how many people are using what energy sources and how does that impact greenhouse gas concentrations, land use, uh, soot, what I'll call aerosols, you know, just dust and particulate matter, what we call in the atmosphere, where that's coming from, where that's going, how those things affect clouds. So uh, all of these inputs have to go in the model to give us the outputs of interest. Temperature is one of the main ones. Precipitation is also another one that a lot of people are, are interested in because of flooding in more recent years. Drought, wildfires, hurricanes, severe weather. Uh, this is what we're trying to pull out of the, these climate models to help people understand their risks moving forward. So, you know, that, that brief summary doesn't do justice, I think, but it hopefully kind of lets uh, gives us some foundation of what we're talking about yeah no, that was that that was uh that was a tall order to ask you to kind of condense all that down and again when we talk about climate models we're talking there's not just one climate model there there are many different climate models regional models global models that people use yeah. and the like and so it does get a little unwieldy very quickly yeah uh, and on that note right, currently the ar6 the uh, sixth assessment report that was just published uh, you know, what models are used, and there's different flavors of models too. Um, currently, there's about a um, 100 different models that are used in these climate simulations coming from about 50 different entities globally. So this is kind of what we're talking about. And as I said, different types of models, these integrated assessment models, these uh, um, global climate models, which are also called atmospheric ocean general circulation models that couple the atmosphere and ocean cliff, as you said, regional climate models that can focus in higher detail on specific parts of the world. Uh, this is the, these are the toolboxes that are currently available to the community. Yeah, and that's what makes this uh, particularly, you know, those of us that are, are risk practitioners or in the financial services industry or, or regulatory community, it's almost mind boggling the 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 amount of, uh, you know, modeling that goes on and how are we, you know, as I refer to it, the uh, the proverbial square peg in the round hole syndrome, how are we to kind of take those outputs and then try and kind of weave them into our financial and risk analyses. Uh, I'll save that for for another moment here, but let me ask you as a follow up to that. So so if you're put on the spot. How would you characterize the accuracy of these models? Realizing, again, we're talking about many models and some are more accurate than others, but how would you generally uh, assess that? And how would you compare, since we now have AR6, how would you compare improvement over time in that regard? Yeah, and that is, boy, that is a tough question um, and really gets to the heart of the matter is how do you define accuracy? You know, what are you looking at to say, oh, our model's really good, and we have a lot of confidence in our model enough that we're going to project into the future. And, you know, thinking back to our undergraduate years, it's like having the answer in the back of the book and trying to reverse engineer that answer. Sometimes we run the we the global we as a community, the 
climate models are run for what's happened in the past to see if those global climate models can reproduce what we already know happened. And if we do a really good job of what's happened in the past, then we say we have good confidence to move into the future. But I do have a, a slide I do want to bring up, I think is represents this pretty well if people can, um, can you see this? Yeah. Okay. So this is the, this is the temperature record. This is the global uh, surface temperature record going back to 1850. And the black line are the, the observations for the global temperature record. The gray shaded region is the representation of this global temperature record from the models used in the AR6. And so this uncertainty, you know, we don't have just one line superimposed on another line. This range, this gray shaded region shows us the range of the climate models. I think we may have lost Tim. We'll give him a moment to come based on, back. on different Based on different scenarios. Oh, did I freeze? Just a little bit. Okay. Did you miss anything important? Oh, probably, but oh, you well, can... maybe not. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the gray shaded region is the ability of the models to reproduce the past. These colored lines are the scenarios, these socioeconomic pathways moving forward that represent what if. What if we do this? What if this happens? So, as I said, you can't. Th this isn't just one perfect line superimposed on another line. This is considered good enough for the climate models. And also considering the further back in time you go, you know, you're tying to data that is also more uncertain, where we have fewer observations the further back in time. So you're trying to tie a model to a time period where we just don't have as much information. And part of the global climate models, what they have to do is represent physical processes that would be happening even if people weren't on the planet, people will say, oh, climate would change even if there wasn't anybody on the planet. Yes, that is quite true. And so how do you represent those processes? Like the El Nino Southern Oscillations is a term probably many people have heard, which is kind of the, helps us understand El Nino, La Nina, kind of the sloshing back and forth of warm water in the tropical uh, Pacific Ocean. You know, this, the, this process would happen whether there are people here or not. And how do you represent that in the models when we don't have really good observations back in time. You know, we don't have a satellite record from 1850. So you use proxies to represent these impacts, you incorporate them in the model. And this is kind of the state of the art, state of the science of where we are right now. This is considered pretty accurate from climate standards. Is this accurate enough for risk folks? And I think that cuts to really the, where we're at right now. The climate models are designed to represent climate based on our best understanding of the science. I'm not quite sure these are the right tools. They're not designed for risk managers. And I think the key is how you translate this into something that is usable by finance sector, governments, that sort of thing. Yeah, that is the $64,000 question, right? Because as, as we've talked, uh, if you look at the, the traditional, let's say, stress test that is imposed on a large bank or the GSEs, you know, they may only go out nine quarters. And what you just showed us there, you know, depending on these SSPs could go all the way out to the year 2100 or, you know, you go out to even 30 years and you have to ask yourself that cone of uncertainty is so wide. How do you really, how do you feel reliable when banks are making strategic decisions every day and even on a strategic plan, how do they get comfortable that implementing this is going to lead them down a path that will be helpful and useful for them in making those decisions? Right, and also understanding that those projections in the past, those shaded regions that I showed are based on an ensemble of models. This isn't just one singular model. It's all of the models that are available and they're all coded slightly differently. And you may ask, well, why do we need all these different models? Well, as scientists, we need access to these tools. And if there's only one model out there, we're not gonna get a lot of work done uh, because everyone has different areas of the climate system that they're focusing on 
and I need to do a simulation that better represents El Nino. I need someone else needs to do a simulation that better impacts or better understands the impact of Saharan dust blowing uh, across the Atlantic Ocean to, that could impact uh, air quality and cloud coverage over Florida. You know, so everyone develops their tools. They all try to, uh, they are based on the fundamental same equations, but how they're incorporated and understanding too, and we're getting in the weeds a little bit here, the, this whole system that we're talking about is not linear. You know, I can't just say, oh, I'm gonna increase carbon dioxide and everything else is, all these other things are gonna increase. You change the balance of energy in the system. It takes a while for the system to equilibrate how it moves that energy throughout the system. So I may increase temperatures, but that increase in temperature goes into sea ice melt. Well, the sea ice melting makes the surface darker, darker surfaces absorb more heat that leads to a further increase in temperature. These what are called feedback mechanisms are where there's a lot of uncertainty in the climate models and how they are incorporated. How do you resolve where a cloud is? Weather models are designed to do these things. Climate models uh, aren't necessarily gonna tell you that there's gonna be a small cloud right there outside my window here at you know two miles above the surface. Uh, because the spatial resolution is such that it's really difficult to do that. Um, and so we're, we're asking the models to do a lot. Um, but I think, you know, one model can't do it. We use an ensemble. And from that ensemble of models, you can come up with these probability distributions of what's going to happen in the future that give us give you a most likely scenario. But I think even then we need to delve in further. Why are the models saying that? And are these averages in the future based on some outliers? Are there a cluster of models that are too high or too low compared to the past? What happens if you remove those from these probability distribution functions? You can make all sorts of pretty pictures of what's going to happen in the future. But, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it a, on the chin for the science community. I'm not sure that the science community, um, you know, we try, but we're scientists and we're hyper focused on on solving this problem at hand. And I think and a lot of scientists realize this and we're trying to do a better job of communicating this to what we call stakeholders or end users. I do a lot of this from the air quality policy side of things, but also the climate side of things. And I teach an introductory class on climate to flute majors, you know, and basketball majors. And so I got to make sure that people can understand this without differential equations and all of that. And it's a challenge. It's a real challenge, so but me, it's a challenge me, we have to face. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about this. You know, we're talking about the, the, the complexity, right, the, of, of these models. And it reminds me, you know, back in the day, uh, having, you know, run groups where periodically we'd be subject to, you know, our regulatory model risk management oversight. And there are very, you know, robust requirements or guidance around uh, how one goes about validating, let's say a financial model, a pricing model, or a loss forecasting model. And I'm thinking to myself, the complexity of these climate models just goes way beyond, I think, some of the complexity that we have on, on, on the financial and risk side of things in banking. And so how do you as you know, a climate or science community validate your models? And I know we talked about back testing and whatnot, but at the end of the day, I, I just ha have to kind of ask the question, how do you get comfortable that these models are right? Yeah, well, you compare to what's happened in the past. You know, we know what the world did. Does the model represent what happened in a, maybe a particular region? And I think this is where having a variety of models, we had the large global climate models, these beasts of computer code. Um, and I think this is where regional climate models can be really helpful in terms of focusing on a specific area and can you take what's coming out of these larger climate models which again aren't necessarily designed to do what uh, the finance sector uh, perhaps the banking sector whoever are asking but to translate use what's coming out of the climate models as inputs into a specialized series of tools that can focus on supply chain flood risk and flood seems to be you know the lower hanging fruit you know where is the water going we know the model says this has how much water should be coming out of the sky. We can compare that to data in the past, whether it's um, stream inundation observations or uh, data from me meteorological stations that measure rainfall rate 
and the amount of rain, which model gets closest? Okay, why does it get closest to reality? And then, okay, the model says this is what's falling out of the sky. You translate that into another model that will, like an inundation model that will tell you, okay, this is what's hitting the land. We've characterized the surface, where the concrete is, the slope of the land, where the water is getting funneled into uh, to help basically translate this global climate model output into something that is more usable for uh, specific stakeholders. And so, and this is, uh, you know, the federal government, NOAA, is uh, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration is really focused on this juncture of here are the weather forecast models, which really get us about 10 days in the future. And many of us have, you know, weather apps on our phone. And then there's the climate models that go out to 2100. So we've got 10 days and 2100 at the extremes. It's the seasonal, the subseasonal in the middle there that is a real focus of the scientific community, recognizing that the global climate models you know, a mortgage is 30 years in the future. You don't care what's happening at 2100. Well, what about in this 30 year time period? And how well can we represent these seasonal changes over time and seasonal changes under a climate scenario? And um, so the scientific community the, is working on this, recognizing this, um, but I, I think new tools are needed and I think tools designed for the risk community. And I think this is where we need a closer interaction and you know this effort that that cliff and i are working on here and you know over the past year just recognizing that we use the english language in a different way and figuring out a new language to translate to understand what the heck we're talking about and saying for me as a scientist like oh this is what you're asking okay this is i think the t the tool you need and uh, to me and i guess this is somewhat of my opinion that's where i think we're where we are right now yeah one of the things that uh, i think companies and and the regulatory community at, at, at large may struggle with a bit is is okay uh these are not models that you're typically going to be building in house right this is not a loss forecasting model where you're sitting on top of your own own level information and you can import all the macroeconomic factors you need to kind of run something you know this you're reliant on let's say maybe in this case more reliant on on vendors supplying climate models uh to an organization and of course, when you're talking about vendor models, and I've vetted those in the past at places that I've worked at, and and they typically are black box, and and I get it, right? They're they're proprietary, all those things. So you know, we probably have a number of people that are uh, here in the audience today that are struggling with that. And so I'd ask you, you know, what should companies be looking at or asking of their climate model vendors? about their models and what can they do for them in terms of their climate risk assessments and disclosures in general? Sure, and uh, just real quick, you, you brought up a point, you know, that the, the models, the global climate models historically haven't included kind of economic factors um, and that kind of feedback of usage of energy, that sort of thing. The new, uh, you know, SSPs are called socioeconomic pathways do try to represent different scenarios in terms of um, the energy intensity, energy usage, how uh, countries are willing to share some of their cleaner technology versus keeping it very much in house. And so these SSP scenarios moving forward do try to take these different types of um, future worlds into account. Maybe not exactly uh, what the, these different uh, stakeholders need, but where we're getting there. Now, in terms of, I think, what vendors may want to be asking or what you know, people here may want to be asking of their vendors who are translating a lot of this information and the global climate model information, the outputs are freely available. If you know where to look or who to ask, it's all out there. Now, you're talking massive amounts of information in file formats that most people aren't familiar with. And how do you take that information, understand that information and make sense of it? And so this is, I think, where a lot of vendors do is take on that role of translator. But uh, I think it also requires some depth of knowledge, not just saying, here's what the climate models are saying, here's your answer. Again, asking why are the models giving us this answer, I think is a key here. You know, what assumptions are the models making how are the models, you know, if we're looking into the future, handling some of these uncertainties in terms of, is what I said earlier, kind of alluded to these feedback mechanisms, 
greenhouse gases increase, the amount of inc uh, increase will determine how temperatures change. So why is your model saying the temperatures are changing, taking into account this redistribution of energy across the planet? And is the model saying this part of the planet's getting warmer and perhaps this part could be getting colder? And so are your, you know, if you're focused on, let's say a whole bunch of mortgages along the Eastern seaboard, is one particular, are, are some of the models getting these differences in temperature are they contradicting each other moving forward? So I'd say a deeper dive without going into equations and all of that. Um, if you're like me, that's a good way to put me to sleep. But really to say, okay, this is what the models are telling us. And, and just embracing, look, this is the best we can do right now. And being very clear and transparent. This is what the models are doing. This is the best we can do right now. We recognize that uh, the models are the scientific community is still trying to nail down the uncertainty of the impacts of aerosols, particulate matter, dust, soot in the atmosphere and how that affects clouds and how clouds then will impact the climate system moving forward. forward. Look, just to be very clear, this is the best we can do right now. This is what we're working on. And I think also being able to, I think what is important is to provide some honest feedback and say, okay, this is the question you asked and we did that for you, but actually this is the question you should have asked now based on our analysis. I, I think that would be valuable to uh, people working with vendors. Maybe some of the vendors will disagree with me, I, I don't know, but I think that's, and as a scientist, that's what I think is important, kind of a, a, a way to understand why maybe it's not the best available or maybe it's not the best but it's the best available and the best we can do right now well, I, I guess i come back to and the practical reality is that how do you even tell how do you differentiate once that you go to, you have you have three vendors come in and and you know they give you you know you run your loans through it and you you look at them and you go how do you select you know, how do you know who's right at the end of the day? I, I Yeah, well, and I think you use an ensemble of the ensembles, I guess, is one thing you can do and say, OK, this is the average of the vendors. Uh, but again, just to, as I tell my students, justify your answer, <laughs> justify your results. Uh, why did your model? Why is your model saying this? Did you apply some uh, statistical downscaling if the if the global climate model you're using is on a hundred kilometer resolution and you're telling me what's happening on a hundred meter resolution how did you get there if you're doing some statistical analysis analysis to say look the model tells us on average what's going on in this grid box and you claim to tell me what's going on right there how did you do that what did you do to constrain this coarser output onto a finer resolution? If you can answer that question with, you know, some certainty, okay, great. And I think that can give uh, a stakeholder better understanding, at least better comfort and saying, okay, uh, you know, this was very complicated what they did. Uh, it's kind of state of the art, understanding the limitation of the models. And um, this is what we're going to move forward with, you know, having, I'm, I'm not, not complaining about the models. I think they're great for what they do, the climate models. I don't think they're designed to do what people need, but let's understand that the climate models and their predictions have been pretty consistent since, you know, the eighties and nineties have all kind of said, you know, this is what we expect to happen. If you take a model from 10, 20 years ago, they're not that far off from where we are now and from what has actually happened. So the climate models are telling and have been telling a relatively consistent story. Yes, there's a lot of uncertainties involved, but have been telling a relatively consistent story. And the new AR6 report has further emphasized on past reports and say, we really, really, uh, with high confidence, where in the past they'd say with some confidence or medium confidence, with high confidence, we say that these things are happening. And I think what differentiates this recent uh, AR6 report is that they're saying now, which they haven't said in the past, is that a lot of extreme events, not a lot, but extreme weather events now can be attributed to a changing system, where in the past they would say, yeah, it seems like this would be, you know, this uh, exceptional rainfall event. Uh, we think 
may be influenced by a, a warming climate, now the AR6 model is saying, yes, we, based on our analysis, uh, is most likely your very high confidence that these extreme events are being caused by a warming climate. Interesting. I mean, at, at the end of the day, um, what do you think are implications then from this AR6 report for financial services and companies in general? Well, I, you know, I think it's obvious that risk is going to increase and it's not just so if you project on what's based on what's happened in the past, here's what's happened in the past, we're going to project a straight line, you're going to be off because these changes are happening uh, non linearly, they're happening faster. And so if the past world is a different planet, it's happened, it's, it's changed now, and is changing in the future. And so we're trying to predict a world that hasn't really existed yet in recent time. And so making these predictions, this is why you have all these SSP scenarios to say, okay, we're not just gonna base on, you know, straight line extrapolation of what's happened in the past, based on our best understand understanding of the physics and the science and the chemistry and the biology, we think this is what the system is gonna look like if we stay on this path or this path or this path. Um, and there was a lot of talk recently about, um, you know, carbon dioxide is always the, the focus, but methane recently and the AR6 and a lot of discussion in COP26 is let's try to regulate methane. On a per molecule uh, basis, uh, methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas on a per molecule basis than carbon dioxide and about 25 to 30 times more powerful. But methane also has a, a shorter lifetime. And so the thinking is, well, we can affect some change now by limiting methane emissions, and that will have a more immediate impact while we're trying to solve the carbon dioxide issue. There are other greenhouse gases out there, nitrous oxide, CFCs, which were banned under the Montreal Protocol because they lead to the destruction of the ozone layer, um, also have an impact. And, you know, Again, without getting into the mathematics of it, if I increase carbon dioxide, it's going to have a different impact on global temperatures than if I increase methane. And trying to understand these varied impacts is part of the complexity of the climate models. And then kind of the downstream, so to speak, impacts. Okay, we've, we've changed the greenhouse gases concentrations. This is how everything is going to adjust. And you want us to tell you if this city is going to be flooded out by this particular date. And that's where the difficulty lies. But the models are all saying these things are happening. And now the latest climate model results are saying more severe weather, more extreme events. And the data have shown more extreme events. You look at the rainfall in New York City from Ida. You know, what, four inches of rain in three hours or in one hour, rather? I mean, that set a record. And that happened in a way that no one predicted could happen. So you're trying to get even these weather forecasting models to predict things that have never really happened before. Right. And that's a big challenge. Yeah, and no, it is a big challenge. And, and the big, the, the, you know, at the end of the day, and I know you and I've talked about this uh, at, at, to some degree that, um, you know, we've got all these various, you know, COP26, you know, Paris Accord and all this kind of stuff, Climate Accord uh, and the like. And you mentioned something that I thought this group might be interested in hearing about, which is, you know, there is hope, right? There is, there is a precedent, if you will, for how policymakers, uh, industry, and academics or scientists can come together to solve a huge environmental problem. And that was around ozone. Is that it, it, there? There was there's quite a bit of discussion about that and. You know, years ago, and I don't know that it's fully been resolved, but it's it's a lot better off, isn't it? Than well, yeah, no. This is a this is a very positive example of some of the best environmental policy that the world has ever enacted, and that was the banning of chlorofluorocarbon CFCs for use in propellants and refrigerants. The pushback at the time was, oh, you know, the the scientific community is trying to trying to get rid of our air conditioning and our hairspray, but is anyone upset i asked my students you know they're only born this century they're young like how many of you are upset about the banning of cfcs and they're looking at me like what are you talking about and so the global community 
got together to solve the problem and everybody benefited. The ozone layer is recovering. It's getting better. And this is demonstrable. The data is showing that the uh, ozone hole is shrinking. Now you get year to year variability, of course, but overall it's getting better uh, because everyone got together to agree. Okay, how to, because no one wins. If you get rid of the ozone layer, you sterilize the surface of the planet and we can only live underwater. And most of us aren't ready to do that. Um, but businesses weren't destroyed. We still have air conditioner. We still have hairspray and propellants. You know, people adjusted, but DuPont was front and center in this, developing the replacements to CFCs. And also, by banning CFCs, there's this whole world avoided scenario because CFCs are some of the most potent greenhouse gases ever created, and they're completely manufactured, unlike carbon dioxide and methane and N2O, which have all sorts of natural sources. CFCs are completely manufactured and they are a wonder of technology because they don't interact with anything. They're not dangerous. You can inhale them and exhale them. They won't kill you. But because of that, they have very long lifetimes and they make it in the stratosphere where the chlorine is stripped off and that can lead to the destruction of the ozone layer. The global community got together, banned them, has been monitoring CFC uh, amounts in the atmosphere, actually recently caught a country cheating. And the scientific community said, hey, uh, the CFCs have started to go up and there is no way that should happen and figured out where that was coming from, contacted that country, that country went to those companies and said, you cannot use these anymore. And because of this sex successful legislation, we are only talking about carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. Otherwise, these CFCs would be having almost the same impact that carbon dioxide would be having with a thousand year lifetime as opposed to carbon dioxide, which is CO2. So we can get together in ways that everybody benefits. I mean, it's not easy, but how do we make changes that allow people to benefit? And that really means we need to take into the full costs of the taking carbon from the ground and putting it in the atmosphere. What is the actual cost in terms of, and who's paying that cost? of flooding out all the coastlines, you know, the reinsurance companies, who's going to lose from these future scenarios that we already see this happening. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a lot of flooding here in Maryland from a low pressure system moving through. You know, this was not a hurricane off the coast. It was just a storm. It was a mid latitude cyclone that came through. And then uh, they're talking about another storm coming through. In parts of the, the country on the East Coast, which I'm more familiar with, you have sunny day flooding. You could go to downtown, downtown Annapolis here in Maryland, and on a sunny day on a king tide, you have streets, parts of the streets flooded because sea level's rising. You know, Miami's taking action against this, putting in pumping systems to push the water back. That costs money. This uh, adaptation, how much is it going to cost in the future? How much are you willing to pay? versus what if we solve the problem now? And I know people are more reactive than proactive, but really fully accounting for the costs and saying, okay, we want to avoid those costs at all possible cases. How do we do that? How do we do that in ways that people like me can invest their meager 401ks in? I th personally, I think this is the key to the future. I think the business community truly holds the key here. You can get all the scientists together saying things which many people ignore, half my students do because they're just trying to get a gen ed credit. But um, I think the people who are really control of a lot of the money, when they talk, so I'm gonna be realistic here. And I think the finance sector can really take the lead working in partnership with the policy side and the scientific side. I This is, I guess, my opinion, but I really think the key moving forward uh, is to mimic the Montreal Protocol and subsequent amendments say, okay, how can we have a Montreal protocol for climate? And I'm not the only scientist saying this. There are a lot of scientists saying this too. We have a roadmap. Let's try to use that template to move forward. Yeah, no, I, I think you're spot on on that one. And um, I guess I'll come back a, a, a little bit more uh, in a detailed way and just say, we talked a lot about the climate models uh, in this session. And what do you think has to get better about those to help folks in industry, regulatory community, get their arms around this. I mean, at the end of the day, they're gonna be, you know, asked or required to go down this path. What can what can the scientists do to kind of help help us and how do we do that? Well, I, I think that what 
the scientists need is to hear more from stakeholders. You know, I'm hired to be a scientist. I'm hired not necessarily, well, because I do policy work on air quality to work with policymakers, but most scientists are focused on solving the problem at hand. And this is a big task just to get the funding to do the job and focusing, hyper-focusing, digging into the minutia details to really understand what's going on. The scientists may be largely unaware of the needs of different communities. And I think what we need is a better opportunity to get everyone together on a similar platform, using a similar language perhaps, or at least train to understand and to translate, okay, oh, I had no idea this is what you really needed. Okay, yeah, I think I can go back and either tweak my model to give us specific outputs, or we've got a regional climate model that can take what's coming from the global climate models to give you specifically what you need, which we are largely unaware of. For a specific sector, maybe not a specific company, but maybe one company, their needs represent the needs of a larger portion of the sector to say, oh, this is what you need. Because I think that's where we're lacking. And honestly, a lot of the scientific community um, may be skeptical of the private sector because we've taken a beating over the years from private, you know, 10, 20 years ago, all the scientists, you know, they're just these elitists using government funds just to maintain their jobs. So we really want to solve a problem. And I think we need stronger, clearer partnerships, both with the uh, policymakers, but with industry to find, okay, what do, you, what do you need? Do we already have this in house? Maybe NASA and NOAA already have this information that can be translated for you. We just didn't know you, you needed it. And I, I think that's at some level, and I think this is happening here and there, but I think we need a, a stronger push in there. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole segment of models that we've actually put on the on the side purposefully today, and that is these integrated assessment models that we that you referred to earlier, um, the dice model and the like. And I think that intersection, uh, you know, while people have won Nobel prizes for 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 their innovation, I'll say, and and kind of bringing all this together those models themselves are fraught with all sorts of uh, assumptions and, uh, you know, things where they're taking, you know, in, you know, outputs from from climate analysis and trying to come up with damage multipliers and assessments. And so, so, so when you talk about that intersection of trying to take those, take those, you know, outputs, the greenhouse gas outputs and the like coming from the climate models into a digestible form that can be say, converted into what typically a, a financial services company is most used to seeing, which are things like changes in home prices, and right. interest rates, and right, and GDP, and unemployment, and commodity prices. I know it can do some of those things, but therein lies also some of the struggle, right? You got climate models over here with their own issues. You got the integrated assessment models over here with their own issues. And this is where I keep coming back and I struggle with how do we kind of better build those kinds of tools that can be leveraged by, you know, the financial community. Anyway, that's that's kind of yeah. what, what I say. No, I, I agree. And this is how the models are developed. Initially, you make assumptions because you don't know. So we're going to assume this is what's happening. And then you realize, oh, that assumption is much more nuanced. And so you dig, take a deep dive in understanding the impact of land use change. You know, what happens when you chop the trees down and convert to farmland? Oh, this has a larger impact than we thought based on, okay, we just had a damage multiplier in there to represent everything. You know, we have to make this more complex. And I think this is where we are now with the climate models. They are so complicated that only a small number of people really can fully understand all of the impacts here and, and how to translate it. But yeah, and so now you're developing these risk models that people have won Nobel Prizes for, but you start digging into that, what assumptions were made? Right. And are oh, those absolutely. assumptions correct? And this is research. Absolutely. And I think, you know, people, I call it shiny object bias all the time, that we get these very complicated, elegant-looking mathematical representations uh, that may not hold up very well, and yet we're being asked to implement them. But I want to yeah, yeah. be mindful of, of, of the time here. We have 10 minutes left. Well, and I want just... Pop yes, in. Exactly. Was awesome. Perfect segue. You're talking about these shiny objects. And so the question is, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks are the big buzzwords right now. Let's train a computer to solve all these problems for us. 
but you have to train a computer. You can't, this isn't Star Trek or Star Wars. Computer, solve this problem for me or holographic displays where you can move things. No, it's grinding out code, you know, black and white text to try to represent this. And so there are a lot of, uh, you know, models that are popping up now that use machine learning, artificial intelligence. And, you know, the, the key here is that the computer can be more sensitive to patterns that will and, and much more quickly pull out patterns that I as a scientist can do. There may be patterns going on in the data that I'm simply not seeing. But these tools now, machine learning and neural networking and artificial intelligence in the past 10 years used to be you had to be very skilled and had to write these codes yourselves. Now there are codes you can download, tools you can use for machine learning and artificial intelligence, neural, neural, neural networking. And now we have the black box problem again. Oh, we ran our neural network. All right. This is the answer you got. Is that physically possible? Did, did you get negative carbon dioxide out of your model, which is physically never going to happen? And, and this is, you know, how, how much are these fancy new shiny tools tied to actual science? Because I've seen talks, people, and not for climate models, but for some uh, other models. Oh, we ran our neural network and this is our result. But yeah, like, mm. yeah, but if you think about it, that's not physically possible. Why would you even say that? Just because the model says it, you paid a lot of money for this new tool, great. It's nice and shiny with this nice shiny user interface and it makes beautiful pictures. It's fundamentally still wrong. Just because it looks nice doesn't mean it's correct. And so this is where you need critical thinking. And this is where I'm uh, not the only one here th saying this. Okay, this is a great tool, but you really need uh, some well-versed scientists who really understand what's going on and say, okay, this is what the model said, but mm, I don't believe it. Uh, it doesn't pass the sniff test. And I'm, I'm worried about some of these artificial intelligence machine learning models um, I'm not saying they're not valuable. I think they are, and I think they will become another tool in our toolbox. Right. But as a, as a skeptical scientist, I always have to like, uh, do I trust these people or not? It's the newest thing. I'm, I'm not 100%. I do think there will be tremendous value because computers can do things that I can't, but you're training the computer on things that have happened in the past. How do you predict something that has never happened before? How do you, how do you tell the computer to anticipate a record event, a record hurricane, a record rainfall event, a record snowfall event. Once it's in the re in the records, then you can train it. Yeah, yeah, here's here's another one. It says, what's the current approach to, to get data to conduct a climate risk analysis for a portfolio of obligors to assess the financial implications of different types of climate events impacting underlying exposures and expected losses. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that one. So I just had an article published in the Journal of Risk Management and Financial Institutions where, is an example of this, where I took um, the publicly, publicly available sample of, a large sample of, of the uh, uh, Fannie and Freddie uh, credit performance data and, um, and built a, uh, a default model with the usual risk factors that we that we think about there, uh, borrower credit characteristics, uh, property loan, all the other usual things, house prices, etc. And then I and then I looked at uh, augmenting that data with FEMA and NOAA data on hurricane disaster declaration information that's available. That is both the the rating of the hurricanes that came through from 2000 and uh, from. 1999 up to the present, basically, and uh, and then also the number of hurricanes that came across the areas that uh, are in the sample. And it turned out when you control for all these things, um, in this case, the uh, default risk was amplified. It was statistically significant in terms of both uh, hurricane intensity and frequency. Kind of no surprise, but that's one way you could think about building on some of these physical risks, not the transition risk, but the physical risk directly into some of, of that kind of analysis. So we got a lot of wood to chop, I'm thinking along the way on all of these. That's just one kind of little example of many, right? You know, you think about the, you know, the trading books that are out there and trying to kind of come up with uh, market value estimates of those. Um, there's, there are, uh, there are all sorts of software that's out there that, that can help you do that sort of thing. But I think that's, 
kind of where the world is right now. And, um, and we're going to have to accelerate a fair amount of that effort, I think. Yeah, and kind of along those lines, you mentioned hurricanes, you know, what are the climate models predicting for hurricanes? Okay, the planet's warming, does that mean more hurricanes? But there are a lot of different uh, conflicting factors here. And what many of the models are saying is that you may have fewer hurricanes, but the hurricanes that do form are going to be larger and stronger. And how do you incorporate that in your risk assessment? Right. Well, again, in this in that simple example I gave, you know, that analysis could inform. And, and I did a little bit of sensitivity analysis from from those estimates to say, OK, let's set, let's suppose the NOAA long range forecast over the next 30 years says that we're going to see twice as many category three to five rated hurricanes. OK, let's pop that into the model now. That's one of our new scenarios. We can drive that through and we can see, OK, defaults are going to be, you know, 30 uh, percent higher than what we expected along these areas that are, are going to be seeing more of these uh, hurricanes come through. That's the kind of stuff that I think yeah. we could we could try and tease out or whether it's, you know, broader base, you know, flood risk, uh, trying to get a handle on that sort of thing, I think is you know, uh, another way to go, particularly as it relates to changes in property values. That's another whole, you know, kettle of fish when we're talking about the mortgage side in, in particular. Yeah. But but I think generally speaking, and I know we're kind of getting close to the top of the hour, um, you know, we've talked about, we've talked about a range of things here. And um, and I guess the, the one of the last things, you know, I would ask you, Tim, to maybe comment on, we've talked about this too in the past between us, you know, weather versus climate. We can't forecast the weather more than 10 days in the future. You know, why should we believe climate model results 20, 30, 50 years from now? Uh, what's the difference between a weather and a climate model? Maybe we kind of tie yeah, that well, off. Weather models are one constrained to observations um, and they're much higher resolution and they're designed to represent smaller scale features. You know, our 10 day forecast now is where our five day forecast was, you know, back in the 70s. Hmm. And it's basically you're, you're fighting chaos. You know, your the results, your output of your model is dependent upon how accurate your inputs are. And the further out in time you go, the more that uncertainty kind of takes over. The forecast community has, you know, given us more accurate forecasts out to 10 days. But the, these models are run and rerun every hour, every three hours. Data are fed into the model saying, here's the state of the atmosphere right now. OK. Now let's go out another 10 days, another hour, more data comes in, they're rerun, and these are, they're run operationally, continuously. All the weather forecasts that you're getting on your phone are based on continuously oper uh, you know, functioning models that are digesting millions of data points from all the weather stations and, and whatnot and satellites all over the globe all the time, constantly, at really high resolution. Climate models can't do that. You can't just continuously run a climate model currently uh, the computers aren't there. We don't have big enough computers to do this. So how do you predict in the future? Well, let's take a random year, 2050. Very basic. Which month is going to be hotter, June or January? So I said there wasn't going to be a quiz. So, But this is a basic one. What month will be hotter in 2050 in Maryland, June or January? I think most people would think June because it's summertime. You've just made a prediction based on your understanding of the physics. And so this is what we're doing with the climate models is taking this larger scale physics, understanding that the climate model will not tell you when your neighborhood will get a rainstorm, but will tell you um, the probability in a sense of increased rainfall amounts, increased droughts, that sort of thing. But again, this is where the, you know, the scientific community is trying to develop those mid-range models. This is a right. big focus, these seasonal to sub-seasonal models to bridge the gap between the climate models and the forecast models. Well, we got to leave it there, my friend. Uh, that was a lot in a short amount of time to digest. And, and again, many thanks for you joining us and kind of walking us lay people uh, through hey. the intricacies of these climate models. Many, thanks many for thanks. Listening. This is awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. And thanks everybody who, who was on today. Uh, the recording will be available later on and we will uh, have another one of these very soon. Thank you all.